Welcome to our Book of Mormon discussion of the historical context and content. We will be discussing Mosiah chapters 25 through 28 this week. And we will begin with a little heartfelt discussion about our youth and children and grandchildren or maybe other friends and loved ones who are, uh, maybe they grew up in the church, but they're not currently living that. Sometimes we call them wayward children. This discussion is really for parents and, and, and friends and grandparents of those people. But let's start by going to chapter 25. You'll notice in chapter 25, verse 2, just a little context in there. It starts out by saying that the, all of the children that were of the Nephites are smaller than all the people of the, of the Zarahemla, the Mulekites, which all of them combined are still smaller than the Lamanites there. That's verse 3. So uh, let's go to verse 5 for a moment. There is one thing that I think is important in here. It's Mosiah reads the record to everybody. He wants to teach them the history of Zenith and so forth. So I think this is an important point to point out to our children and grandchildren of why do we study history? Why do I have to take history lessons? But the answer is really in verse 7. It says, Now when Mosiah had made an end of reading the records, his people who tarried in the land were struck with wonder and amazement. If we teach history effectively, our children will learn from the mistakes of the past. Plus, they'll also learn the good things from the past. And they will be struck with wonder and amazement. I, there's just a power in teaching history appropriately. In fact, if you go to verse 12, the people who were the children of Amulon no longer wanted to be called the children of Amulon. In fact, right in the middle in there, it says that they would no longer be called by the names of their fathers. We've talked a lot in the last several weeks about uh, making a name or changing our name or taking upon us somebody else's name. In this case, there's a group of people who they just wanted to be called Nephites to separate themselves, to distinguish themselves. So again, here you can have a great conversation about what, what does our name mean? Uh, take your family and say, what's our last name? What does it mean? I'm not talking the literal translation from a few hundred years ago, but in the words of the members of our ward or school or community, does our name have a good connotation? Do people think of that name and think, oh, that's an honest family. That's a good, hardworking family. Or what's that name mean? Let's just go straight to verse 23 then uh, for chapter 25. And now there were seven churches in the land of Zarahemla. Remember, those are what we would call wards or branches. And it came to pass that whosoever were desirous to take upon them the name of Christ or of God, they did join the churches of God. That's really what it comes down to is that Mosiah chapter 5 that we talked about previously that once we make a covenant, a commitment, we take upon us the name of, of Jesus Christ. Let's go straight to chapter 6, or 26. The problem with chapter 26 is the rising generation. They don't take upon them that name. They don't make the covenants. They don't understand. So, again, if you're a parent or a grandparent or have anyone you know and love that knew or had the gospel of Jesus Christ, but currently isn't living it. This chapter and this sequence of chapters, I think the Lord put in there for us. I, I really do. Uh, notice in verse 1 that they could not understand the, king, the words of King Benjamin because they were little. But that's not the real problem. Because I wasn't around when Joseph Smith was, a, was around. I was too obviously not around. I, in fact, Spencer W. Kimball, I was little when he talked. But that doesn't mean I can't learn to believe. But the real problem is the end of verse 1. They did not believe the traditions of their father. Well, what's the traditions? Well, it's about verse 2, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the whole gospel. Verse 3, and now because of their unbelief, they could not understand. Here, there's a link between belief and understanding. It's possible to really know something, but not believe it. For example, uh, I know that eating multiple desserts every single day will help me be unha unhealthy, I'll gain weight, uh, 
dot, dot, dot. I know that. But does that really change my behavior? Do I really understand it? Uh, understanding makes a, a link with, with changing one's actions. In this case, they don't understand it because they don't believe it. And they're linked between those two things. So think about, if I don't understand a principle of the gospel, is it because I don't believe it? Or do I not believe it because I don't understand it? I think when we increase knowledge and understanding, then the power to take effective righteous action increases and we become more like the Savior. And I think all of those are, are all intertwined. So if we can increase our belief, we increase our understanding. I've sat in math classes before where I did not understand a thing. There was a point where I could replicate it, but I really didn't understand it. Maybe that there's truth with the gospel where sometimes our children or somebody doesn't really understand it because they don't believe it. If they want to believe it and they want to and they study and they learn more, the Spirit will teach them and increase both. I just think that's a, an interesting discussion to have in there. So let's go to verse 4 for a moment. Because of their lack of belief and understanding, they don't get baptized which means, the end of verse 4, they're not calling upon the Lord their God. They're not praying. They're basically, they're not doing the doctrines of Christ. They don't have faith. They don't repent. They don't be baptized. They're not making covenants. And this group in verse 5 talks about numbers. They're a small group. They're less than half of this group, but their numbers are growing. Well, why are they increasing? I think that's interesting there is, uh, go to verse 5 and 6 and uh, verse 6, and it came to pass that they did deceive many with their flattering words. Sometimes I really think the adversary's tactics are logical. And sometimes they even make sense to the point where members who have faith start to doubt their own beliefs. And I think that's what's going on here. Their arguments are really, really strong. Which means I really believe we as members need to teach logical arguments and counter arguments so they will not only know, but they will understand and increase their belief. Let me give you one example. And I, I really do not mean this to be offensive. But we live in a world in the last decade or so that has accepted uh, gay marriage as acceptable. Clearly, the Lord's teachings are contrary. Now, those proponents of gay marriage are really talented at making it look like if you don't support gay marriage, you hate gay people. That is absolutely false. God loves all of his children, regardless of their actions and attitudes and uh, their desires. And all. I mean, he loves all of his children. We, we all know that. So because I support one thing, does that mean I hate the other? No. But the, but the logical, the argument seems logical in the mind of many, especially the younger generation. So is it possible that we can say, okay, let's take a look at this from the Lord's view. Is it possible that God loves all of his children? Absolutely. Is it possible that people are attracted to their own gender? Absolutely. It's possible. Is it possible that God says, even though you are, I still want you to do something different. Fight and, and go against that natural man. Well, yeah, we see that in all kinds of examples. And again, I don't mean to put specific pick on that one there, but I think this is true in many things that the argument of the uh, against the Savior's commandments sometimes seems logical. So we need to teach, okay, then what is marriage? Marriage obviously is more than just a feeling and a commitment between two people who love each other because I love lots of people. And in many cases, I want to make a commitment to them as friends but that does not include a, a relationship that will bring children into the world or raise children and so forth. So we have to look at things the way the Lord sees things, not the way the world sees things. And sometimes we have to explain it that way. Uh, I think that's enough of that. We'll move on to the next little part here. So in here, the argument of this rising generation that is not making covenants, they're not saying their prayers, and they're not progressing. Not only are they just falling away from the church, they're taking people with them. In this case, we know that Alma, who is will become the prophet here, 
uh, his own son. Mosiah, who is the king and leader, uh, his sons fall away and take a lot of people with them. In fact, if we go to verse... Uh, let's go down to verse, the end of verse 6. Therefore, it became expedient that those who were committed, that those who committed sin that were in the church should be admonished by the church. In other words, what kind of a church do you have that lets its own members engage in sinful behavior with no repercussions? You don't have a church. There has to be a standard in there. So notice verse 7. How is it that the church identifies those that are in, in, engaged in sinful behavior? Verse 7 says, It came to pass that they were brought before the priests. Now remember, who's the president of the priest quorum? It's the bishop. So this would be like our bishops. And delivered up unto the priests, or the bishops, by the teachers. Now, it's interesting. The Doctrine and Covenants clearly says that one of the responsibilities of a teacher's quorum is to visit the members of the church, see what their behavior is, uh, reprove them if they're doing iniquity, and in this case, they report back to the bishops, which is really what should be happening today. Our Aaronic priesthood, along with our Melchizedek priesthood holders, should be visiting all the members of the church. If they know things that our people are living in, uh, living contrary lifestyles to the church of Jesus Christ and the standards, that should be brought back to the bishop. Now, why? Is it to get people in trouble? No. In fact, you're going to see something amazing here in just a moment. Verse 8, the king... Oh, in verse 7, they brought him to the high priest who was Alma. In this case, that's that would be kind of like our stake president today. He is the president of the high priests within the area. In other words, he's in charge of all the bishops too. Verse 8, and the king, Mosiah, had given Alma the authority over the church. So we now have two leaders. We have a political leader, Mosiah, and we have a religious leader, Alma. And they're trying to figure out, okay, who deals with this situation? In other words, when we have a legal action, where do we go? Well, that depends. Is it a legal church action? It should go to the church. If it's a legal court action, it goes to the, the legislature or the judicial system in, in this case. So let's continue on here and see what are we supposed to do with people who are engaged in sinful behavior that's contrary to the commandments of God? Well, you'll notice that Mosiah is not going to judge them. He sends them to Alma because he says that's a church problem. So Alma is going to go and find out, okay, how do I deal with our challenges? That is verse 13 and 14, specifically 14. And it came to pass that after he had poured out his whole soul to God, the voice of the Lord came unto him. Now, Alma is about to have an experience, very sacred, I almost I, I speak of it with reverence, but he wants a solution to his problem, so he goes to the Lord. Well, where do we go to our problems? You know, do we go to Google, or do we go search the gospel of Jesus Christ and take it straight to the Lord himself? Joseph Smith asked God. Uh, he went directly to the source. But in verse 15, the voice of the Lord comes unto him. Blessed art thou, Alma. And he... The Lord teaches him doctrine, but he does more than just that. If we go to verse 20, thou art my son, and I covenant with thee that thou shalt have eternal life. If you'll notice in there, the Lord is promising Alma eternal life. This is what we call, there's many names for this, but one of them is he's receiving his calling and election. He, it's being made sure. Now, uh, let's just take a look at a, a couple quick things with this one. There's a couple verses I really like that can, uh, on your own, you can do some personal study with this. One of them is uh, Ether chapter 3. I'm going to Ether chapter 3. Brother of Jared has a similar experience. Uh, and in verse 13, it says, And when he had said these words, behold, behold the Lord show, showed himself unto him. And said, Because thou knowest these things, ye are redeemed from the fall. Therefore ye are brought back into my presence. Therefore I show myself unto you. Again, the brother of Jared's having a very, very sacred experience where he has the privilege and the opportunity to go through the veil and be in the presence of the Lord. Now some of you will have feelings that you've heard those phrases before. 
I, I, there's some beautiful things in there. Go to section 131 of the Doctrine and Covenants. In, in verse 5, it says, The more sure word of prophecy, that's another name for it, means a man's knowledge that he is sealed up unto eternal life by revelation and the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. Again, you can have a promise that you're going to be sealed for eternal life. You can have a promise that you're going to have. That is a, a promise of the more sure word of prophecy. Or if the Savior himself comes and delivers that message, and in that instance, you have had a second coming. Joseph Smith's second coming of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was in the spring of 1820. Those who have this experience, the brother of Jared and so forth, they have this special experience with the Savior. I feel that's uh, comfortable with uh, addressing that. You can search both of those terms in the Scriptures and have a, a splendid experience with the Spirit guiding you through those two terms. So here's the Lord going to answer Alma's question, is what do we do with wayward members of the church? There's this more than loving and merciful approach. Let's go to verses 22 uh, through 30. That whole thing in there is about, let's give them a chance to repent. If anybody repents, uh, we'll accept them back. And I think Joseph Smith was a great example of that. I mean, he had people who uh, betrayed him. He went to jail because of members of the church. And at the same time, they came in and asked for forgiveness, and he, forgive and move on, brought them back into the church. I think there's a great example there. And that's, and that's how we judge. Uh, verse 30, Yea, and as often as my people repent, will I forgive them. There's no 7 times 70 limit, even though we know that that's not a limit. There is clearly as many times as they will repent. Uh, I will forgive them of their trespasses against me. Verse 31, and ye shall also forgive one another. Now, how's that for counsel? And I think every bishop, every church council I have ever served on, whether it's on the ward level or stake level, mercy and forgiveness has been the major theme in every case, even in some cases where Again, the world and the logic would say, uh, you don't deserve mercy. In every case, mercy has been extended to the point where we just want to help the individual person. And that's the case in this case. But verse 32 is clear. Whosoever will not repent of his sins, the same shall not be numbered among my people. In other words, if someone has the attitude of, I'm not going to change, I'm not going to repent, I'm going to do what I want, and it's completely contrary to the commandments of God, they're removed from the church. In one aspect, that's an act of mercy. You're no longer bound by the restrictions and the blessings of the church. You look at it however you want to look at it, and uh, it's great. So Alma goes through this process and, and uh, says, okay, we need to have mercy and love and welcome anybody who's welcome to come back in the church. But at the same time, if they're not, uh, we'll just remove their names from the records of the church. Now, that's a church issue. issue. What if it's a legal issue? That's chapter 27. They have a council in verse 1. If you'll notice this council, uh, King Mosiah, in the very, very end, and Mosiah consulted with his priests. So he's talking with his leaders. says, what do we do? Well, the council is a proclamation is going to be sent forth. We have just had a recent proclamation in this church sent about the gospel of Jesus Christ and the restoration and Joseph Smith and so forth. Well, here's a procl proclamation that's going to be sent forth saying, a legal one, you can't persecute. Anybody should be able to say what their, uh, what their religious beliefs are, but you can't persecute them for them. In other words, and we're having this issue in the world today, aren't we? If my religious beliefs say I can and can't do certain things, I should be able to do and live my religion freely without another religious beliefs making me do something that goes contrary to my beliefs. Yet they should be able to do what they want. They can't force me. In other words, if another group wants to, to um, have a, a wedding that we wouldn't approve of in our church, they shouldn't force us to accept or perform the wedding in, in our temples or in our church meeting houses and so forth. Uh, there's lots of examples that we can go through that. 
But notice in verse 3, an equality should be among all men. But yet at the same time, everyone should be able to preach whatever religious beliefs they want. I really believe that. We should expect that from ourselves and we should give that respect to other people as well. So let's go down to verse... Uh, 11. Uh, we won't address this. This is the story I think most people are familiar with once you've read the story that an angel comes, to, uh, angel of the Lord comes to Alma the Younger and the four sons of Mosiah. And they have this very uh, sacred experience. But I want you to do a little compare and contrast. It is nothing like Alma the Senior's experience. Alma is receiving his calling and election, he is having a tender experience with the Savior. Alma the Younger is being chastised, called to repentance, and condemned for his actions and behavior to the point where, using his terminology, his experience, he is unto death. That's verse 28. Uh, verse 19, he struck dumb. Uh, he is suffering. Uh, I know a lot of us look, oh, repentance is three days. I'm done. Alma did it. Alma's repentance, it's not about the duration or the length of time. It's about the, the, the 100% did it cleanse my soul. And he suffered. I believe it was ultimate suffering for three days before he felt the redeemed from the Lord. Uh, and then notice verse 16. Again, there is a history lesson in verse 16. Now I say unto thee, go and remember the captivity of thy fathers. In other words, go learn your dad's history because you didn't learn the lesson. Uh, from him by listening to him. Now I'm calling you out to repentance. Go and relearn that history lesson. I, I think there's a great lesson in that too. Let's go to verse 26. This is chapter 27, verse 26. Uh, verse 25 is, you must be born again, become his sons and his daughters. We've talked about that in Mosiah chapter 5 again. But verse 26, and thus they became new creatures. This is the whole conversion process that they have to completely change, starting with their hearts. And in this case, it took an angel. This is like Saul, uh, an angel having to come. This is not something that I want. I want to soften my own heart and have a change where I accept the Savior uh, of my own free will and choice, not because of an angel casting me down and calling me to repentance, and I have to go through that suffering uh, to be shooken to uh, awaken. Now remember, Alma the Younger still had his agency. He could have rejected the, the angel. Laman and Lemuel did when they were struck down by an angel. But uh, we don't want an angel having to come and call us to repentance. We can do that on our own and repent and make those changes with us. Let's go to chapter 28, our last chapter for this scripture block. Let's take a look at the true uh, result of repentance. Let's just go down to verse 12. Uh, uh, what they, here's the sons of Mosiah. They desire to go on a mission. Where do they want to go? Well, they want to go preach to the Lamanites. I mean, how do you know if someone's really repented? Well, they've changed. There used to be a great line in the handbook about to bishops saying, how do you know if someone's sincere repentance? It says, give them time to show they're, they'll, they'll be changed people. In other words, I can go in and, and confess uh, my sins and being tearful, and it can be heartfelt, it can be sincere. But how do you know if that's changed or if that's just emotion? Well, the change will be evident over time. Give me six months. If you haven't seen my behavior and my actions change during that six months, I haven't really changed. I just had an emotional experience before. So how do I know if my kid who's maybe done something wrong, Dad, I'm sorry, I repent. Well, let's find out. I'm going to give you a time period to observe your behavior. And sometimes they say, well, Dad, you just don't trust me. You don't love me. No, I really love you. But how do I know if you change? I just have to give you time and watch your actions. And likewise, uh, for me, change and repentance, it, it takes time. It takes time. Uh, now let's go down. I said go down to verse 12 for a moment. I, I Here's an interesting word that we use a lot in society. We talked about this again when we uh, did Jacob. Uh, it says, and he did... And this he did because of the great anxiety of his anxiety of his people. We talk about anxiety a lot, and we always talk about that's a, a, a negative thing. But in this case, their anxiety was for the welfare and the for they were desirous beyond measure to know concerning these people who had been destroyed. They want to know about people. Uh, it's about love. 
if we have anxiety because we love somebody and I really am concerned about my children and they growing up righteously and that's causing me anxiety, if if it's within the way the Lord's using the term, that's a good thing because it will motivate us to, to perform or to act or to uh, become more Christ-like. So in this case, he wanted to translate the plates and the records and he uses the two stones and thus we see that he is a seer. Verse 17 is a great account. Mosiah had finished translating these records. Behold, it gave an account of the people who were destroyed. This is the Jaredite record that Limhi's people found. From the time that they were destroyed back to the building of the great tower and the time the Lord confounded the language of the people. Again, verse 19, this account shall be written hereafter. So that's our book of Ether today we have in the Book of Mormon. Again, here's a history record so we can learn lessons and the Lord commands his leaders to say, okay, study this history, read it, know it, learn the lessons from them. So one of the things that we can learn about in today's lesson is our children will go wayward. I want to share something very special from them. In the Enzyme, in, this is September 2002, there is a full one-page document in the Enzyme that's entitled, Hope for Parents of Wayward Children. Here's a, a picture of it from the magazine. You can find it online. It's not put up in this uh, format. It's just listing the four quotes. But again, here we have prophets quoting prophets in our current correlated enzyme. These are some beautiful doctrines. I hope you really read and, and study these. Uh, I, I would just like to read uh, President Packers. Uh, his is the one on the bottom right. Uh, and I can make it so you can see this here a little bit on your screen. Or again, just look it up on the September 2002 enzyme. Because a lot of times parents really worry and they're, the anxiety of I my kid's not coming to church, he's not keeping and making covenants. In fact, he might or she might be living a lifestyle completely contrary to the gospel, which I taught them. Listen to President Packer. The measure of our success as parents will not rest solely on how our children turn out. That judgment would be just only would be just only if we could raise our families in a perfectly moral environment and that now is not possible it is not uncommon for responsible parents to lose one of their children for a time to influences over which they have no control they agonize over rebellious sons or daughters they are puzzled over why they are so helpless when they have tried so hard to do what they should. It is my conviction that those wicked influences one day will be overruled. We cannot overemphasize the value of temple marriage, the binding ties of the sealing ordinance, and the standards of worthiness required of them. When parents keep the covenants they have made at the altar of the temple, their children will be forever bound to them. Now, I'll tell you what I know and what I don't know. I know that when I make a temple sealing covenant, nobody can break that covenant. And I have made a temple covenant that my children will be sealed to me for all time and all eternity. I also know that children have their agency. So how do you put those two things together? Here's what I don't know. I don't know how the Lord will do it. If I have a child that decides to leave the church and live a lifestyle contrary, I do know some way, somehow, the power of the atonement is so powerful that it will overturn all negative consequences of this world and that child will be, back, brought, be brought back to me. How that will take place, I'm not sure. You can read those other three quotes. There's some really good ones in there. They share some further light and knowledge on this subject. But I do know this. Whether in this life or the next life, temple sealing promises and covenants will all be fulfilled. I know that is true. Now, this is a great chapter uh, section for those of us who uh, uh, know people that aren't members of the church or have left the church or are not active because of uh, their decisions. Uh, the next few chapters are going to talk about political 
uh, differences. This one's more of a spiritual side. We'll get into the political next week. Next week is Mosiah 29 through Alma 4, and I will have a, a video ready for you then. May the Lord bless you in all that you do.